My name is Julien Descamps, and I am a second year MPA student here at the Kennedy School, also serving as the president of the European Club at HKS. And I'd like to welcome both our in-person and virtual guests. For those of you in the Zoom room, feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box. Also, be aware that this session is being recorded, that your image may appear in this recording, and that we may post this video to the Belfer Center's website. It is prohibited to record without an authorization. It is my great pleasure to welcome Edouard Philippe, former Prime Minister of France, to the Kennedy School. Edouard Philippe is a French politician serving as mayor of Le Havre since 2020, previously holding office from 2010 to 2017. He is, since November 2021, president of the International Network of Port Cities. Prior to his posting as mayor, he was Prime Minister of France from May 2017 to July 2020 under President Emmanuel Macron. He served as a member of the National Assembly from 2012 to 2017, representing the seventh constituency of Seine-Maritime. The best. A lawyer by occupation, Edouard Philippe is also a writer who has published two novels with uh, co-author and friend Gilles Boyer, L'heure de vérité and Dans l'ombre, and an essay on his vision of government, Impression et Claire. He has also published a personal work of nonfiction exploring his love for literature, Des Hommes qui lisent. Nathalie Colbert, executive director of the Belfast Center, and Svenja Kirch, fellow with the Project on Europe and the Transatlantic Relationship, will be moderating this discussion. Please join me in welcoming Edouard Philippe at the Kennedy School. Hello. Hello, you hear me? Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I've been told that uh, I had to speak in English. And that's uh, very bad news for me. <laughs> and it's probably not a very good news for you either. Um, a long, long time ago, uh, I got my first job at the French mission to the UN, and I had to uh, deliver a speech at the sanctions committee of the uh, United Nations. And I was, I felt so nervous that uh, I could feel my knees literally shaking because it was my, my first speech. Now I have uh, made probably hundreds of uh, speeches and my knees are not shaking anymore. But I'm, <laughs> but I'm still suspicious of speeches. Maybe because I am a man from Normandy and you may or may not know that uh, the Normans are often considered as to have a measured, sometimes taciturn temperament. I appreciate chatty personalities, provided that they act as well as they speak. That's probably the reason why I admire so much President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt. Speak softly and carry a big stick, was his favorite proverb, inspiring the big stick ideology. In his uh, Nobel lecture in May 1910, you probably remember that he said, our words must be judged by our deeds, and in striving for a lofty ideal, we must use practical methods. So the big stick, and you get Nobel Peace Prize. I admire President Roosevelt because he sought that power, and not only principle, shared in governing the course of events. I'm always astonished to hear political decision makers talking about or only about values and friendship when they try to conceive international relations. Of course, friendship and values matter. I could quote one of the most pertinent analysts of power in the old 20th century. It could have been Henry Kissinger, but I was told, no, you crazy, you don't quote Henry Kissinger in Harvard. So let's be serious. I will quote the best analyst of power in the 20th century, Don Corleone. Because I love Coppola's Godfather as much as I love Henry Kissinger. Friendship, I won't say that with the accent of Don Corleone. Friendship is more than talent. It is more than the government. It is almost equal a family. Sure, we need friendship. And sure, values and interests often converges for a democratic state. 
But when we tackle the world order, try to assess other countries' ambition and ensure that they do not lead to disruption and chaos, we should rather think of interest and mechanics, especially if we want to prevent war. As I come from Normandy, I know what I owe the US, the very fact that I live in a free country. And we people in Normandy cannot forget what we owe to the US. We know the value of our transatlantic alliance. And I'm proud to say that France and the United States have a very, very long and deep friendship. As you may know, France and the United States were never at war against each other. Spanish people, Italian people, German people, even British cannot say the same. <laughs> Immediately after 9-11, France came to the support of, to the US uh, in Afghanistan. The fight against Daesh still unites us in Iraq, in Syria, and I'm grateful for the American support against jihadist groups in Sahel. Still, we all agree that being allies doesn't mean being aligned. I am proud that my country tried 20 years ago to deter the US to start a war in Iraq, a war which was neither legitimate nor necessary or promising. The US administration mistook President Chirac's warnings. I regret it for the dire consequences that the Iraq war had on the Middle East. I also deplore that when Bashar al-Assad used chemical weapons against his own people, whereas France was ready to strike, the US backed away from the obstacle at the last moment. And when, and when President Biden warned about the imminent risks of a Russian war of aggression in Ukraine, there were minds in my country who didn't believe him. So yes, there are misunderstandings between our two countries. I know how difficult it can be to understand France from an American perspective. Well, French people, are no different whether they react to domestic issues or to international relations. They express their disagreement loudly. But at the end of the day, they are essentially solid as a rock. Look at NATO. From De Gaulle to Macron, we have managed to be constantly entertaining on that issue. Some might believe we fundamentally dislike NATO. I couldn't disagree. I strongly disagree. If we are vocal about NATO, in my view, it is simply because we are serious about NATO. When Turkey blackmails Sweden, we don't like it. When a former American president confuses allies with vassals, we don't like it. But when allies are at risk, we are there. We were there in Afghanistan, we are there in Kosovo. And early January last year, even before the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine started, we sent troops in order to reassure Romania and the Baltic states. In NATO, France managed to be both the bad boy and the best friend at the same time. And the thing is, it's not always very easy to understand you either, even if we love America, as I do. I live in the US when I was 25. I worked for an American law firm when I was 35. As a boxer, I worship Mohammed Ali. I'm a suspicious of speeches, but I have a genuine admiration for Barack Obama and Ronald Reagan, for Abraham Lincoln, and for President Jed Bartlett. If I hadn't seen the West Wing, I would not think politics in the same way. I would not be a politician in the same way. When I taught law at Sciences Po in Paris, I always told my students that the best way to understand American institutional game was to read De la Démocratie en Américaine, on America, written by Alexis de Tocqueville, who came from Normandy, and to watch the West Wing. And usually they follow the second part of my advice more than the first one. So even if we love America, it's not always easy to understand it. Three American presidents in a row have repeated that they would primi primarily focus on the Indo-Pacific and that Europe should handle its problem by itself. It came as a shock for countries in Europe which were used to outsource their security to the US, but the notion that Europe should take a greater part in its security was consistent with the French vision of strategic autonomy. But the Trump administration did everything it could to denounce and deter European strategic autonomy. If things are going much better now with the Biden administration, doubts remain. 
When France worked with Australia to help the Australian Navy get stronger in a challenging geostrategic environment, the US act coverly to derail the deal and replace a strong, realistic French-Australian partnership on submarines with what I believe a more hypothetical and distant AUKUS. To make the transatlantic alliance stronger, there has to be a stronger European pillar to it, and there has to be rules that are the same for all. Differences trigger divergences, which trigger distrust. And the geostrategic context isn't the most appropriate to accept a lack of trust inside NATO. This is the reason why we must have a conversation about Turkey, by example. Seen from Washington, Turkey is primarily the second largest NATO army and a key player in the international agreement on grain exports from Ukraine. But how many NATO members have bought Russian military equipment in the recent years? Welcome Russian oligarch and dramatically increased their trade with Russia since last year. Turkey does. Which NATO member blackmails Sweden and set conditions for Stockholm's accession to the alliance that have nothing, nothing to do with NATO security? Turkey does. Which NATO member regularly threatens another NATO member, Greece, and an EU member, Cyprus? Turkey does. The list is long, and one could add the go it alone Turkey strategy in Libya, Syria, and Iraq, or its steady support to Azerbaijan against Armenia. Armenian people have already suffered genocide. Now, President Aliyev, the president of Azerbaijan, supported by Turkey, expresses a clear will to appropriate this strategic land and to exterminate Armenian people. I have been to Armenia a few weeks ago. Armenians have no weapon, and they have few allies. They can't rely on strategic depth as Ukraine can. So if we attach importance to values and democracy, it can be a good idea to support Armenia. And if we don't, if we think that only interest matters and that our interest is to contain the appetite of power of Turkey, it's also a good idea to support Armenia. In fact, I think it's always a good idea to support Armenia. Turkey behavior is telling of the world we are living in, a world where authoritarian regimes dispute, dispute, dispute the international order because they try to replace the rule of law by the law of the fittest. Russia, China, or Turkey have a common goal to assert themselves by force, if need be, and to disregard the West in a different way, in a very different way. But still, India wants to assert its role in international governance. And the fact is, we gave all the, the, that countries some reasons to believe it was possible. Europe and the US each had its share in, the new, in this new world disorder. We see the US going with European allies to Afghanistan for an excellent reason to deny terrorists safe havens, then drifting into an unrealistic nation building mission and after assessing the failure of this adventure that was doomed to fail, rushing to leave it 20 years later without any consultations with its partners, leaving the country in the hands of the most barbaric and backwards armed groups. Is Europe any better? I'm not so sure. Most European countries have used peace in Europe as a pretext to spend as little as possible on defense. And most of them didn't react when Putin started to destabilize the world order. Crimea, Donbass were treated like a regional crisis, which triggered some sanctions, true, but not strong enough nor decisive action. Meanwhile, we increased our dependencies on Russian oil and gas as if nothing serious could happen, as if Nord Stream 2 wasn't obviously more a geopolitical project designed at weakening Ukraine than a rational economic instrument. Of course, we can be proud of the unity of the West in supporting for Ukraine. It was not a given, and Putin obviously miscalculated our resolve. But we must speed up our weapon deliveries and force the sanctions we decide and make it harder to circumvent them so that Ukraine wins faster. Diplomats have to convince the global south of the importance of this war. 
We don't need another means agreement. We don't need a rushed negotiation, which would, which would only suspend military action in Ukraine and embolden military adventurers elsewhere. We need Ukraine to win. As a French politician, I am determined to reinforce my country's role and influence on the international scene. You know, France still aims to recover its grandeur. But the truth is, we have become a middle power plus, I would say. Not any middle power, as we can send troops in different parts of the world, and as we can benefit of an absolutely independent nuclear deterrent. But I am too much of a patriot to be willing to isolate my country from what makes it stronger, and that's both NATO and the EU. There is no reason to oppose the Atlantic Alliance with the efforts we are doing in strengthening European defense. And the US, in my view, needs a strong EU which can withstand the turmoil over time. An EU which can fight hybrid threats with more tools than a purely military alliance. An EU which attracts and magnetizes countries and peoples from Georgia to Moldova and throughout Western Balkans. An EU which is showing the way on the regulation of internet big players. An EU that is not decoupling from China because you don't isolate the world's second economy without heavy consequences. And I didn't see the US isolating China's economy yet. Never in recent history has the US needed a strong EU more because multilateral organizations have been systematically weakened because the rise of China and its assertiveness cannot be addressed in isolation, we cannot afford to act everyone in its corner. I would just like to tell you about my last, not my last, the preceding last, come on, the avant dernier. The second last, thank you so much. The second last encounter I had with Xi Jinping. I met him twice. I was prime minister, once in China, once in Paris. And the first time it was in Beijing, we spoke for one hour together. And at the end of the conversation, President Xi told me in these exact words, for decades, the vault of heaven was held on giant shoulders, American and Russian one. Then it was only held on American shoulders and they seem to meet some difficulties to hold it alone. But don't worry, soon we will be holding it. So I said I was suspicious of speeches, but I'm also suspicious of how little attention is given to speeches. Contrary to many democratic leaders, autocrat ends up quite often doing what they have said. See Vladimir Putin and he's not the only one. So let me conclude with an anecdote. You, you may have read that incredible book which was, which was written by Primo Levi. In Italian, the title is C'è questo en un uomo. Si c'est un homme en français. And Primo Levi, who speaks about uh, the masculine of Jews in Europe during the Second World War, Primo Levi was doing a signing in a European la, uh, uh, bookstore. When a German guy found himself in front of him, telling him, I have read your book. I was totally upset by your story. I am so, so very much sorry about what Germany has done. But you know, we didn't know. And Primo Levi answers, you didn't know? Well, you just had to read. You just had to listen. So here you are in one of the most magnificent schools in the world, sharpening your wit, forging your mind. And that's exactly, in my view, what you should do. Read books and listen carefully to the world. Thank you. Okay.
Thank you so much for your remarks. And on behalf of the Belfer Center and the Harvard Kennedy School, thank you for joining us today, for sharing your time, especially with our students. Um, this is always a real treat and opportunity for us to host um, former officials and, and spend some time talking candidly with you. So thank you. Um, I think in terms of the next phase of the program, we'll do a few questions to, <clears throat> uh, I think, pick up on some of the themes that you highlighted in your remarks on France's foreign policy, its foreign engagement. Um, and then we'll open it up to the students for their questions, which often are the most challenging ones we find here at the Kennedy School. <laughs> um, before we turn to, to France's foreign policy, to its engagement on the global stage, um, I have the honor to start questions. And I think what we'll do is just start quickly with a domestic question. Uh, obviously, President Macron and his, his um, recent reforms have made the news over the last few weeks and months. And so I wanted to start first on uh, helping us our, uh, understand, um, unpack, what this means for French society moving forward, what it means for um, President Macron's presidency moving forward. So this is in reference to obviously the protests that we've been seeing over the last few weeks, his um, uh, reforms around pension, um, which I know were recently signed this week, so they are moving forward. Um, what are the implications for uh, President Macron's uh, additional priorities moving forward in the rest of his term? How does this play out with his political opponents? And on the reforms specifically, What's the long-term implication? Will they hold with, with the current kind of French uh, public pressure against these reforms or what's the viability of them moving forward? So if you can help us uh, unpack that landscape. Thank you both. This very simple question. <laughs> um, I have a theory about that. And the theory goes like this, in every nation, probably in every democracy, there is one question which is very easy to solve everywhere else and that you cannot solve at home. In the United States, it's the guns. I mean, I mean, uh, obviously the United States cannot solve that issue and obviously everyone else has. And I would add quite easily. And you can solve it. It doesn't mean that you're not a democracy. It means that it's your problem. In France, we have the pension reform. Easily solved everywhere else by any other democracy. You know, Germany, Italy, Spain. They said, OK, we, we have to balance the budget. And so we have to go and work until 65, 66, 67. Everywhere else, the question is easily resolved, except in France. In France, it's touch it and you die. <laughs> really. <laughs> I know. I tried. <laughs> and, uh, well, I, I didn't die, except that uh, COVID, uh, well, COVID came along. I don't think there was a link between the pension reform and the COVID pandemic, but, but COVID came along and, and we had to stop the, the president reform. So, so what I'm, I'm telling you is that because uh, the pension question subject issue in France is, has become somehow irrational. Probably as the guns issue has become somehow irrational. Very irrational some, somehow, but irrational. In, in, the, in the importance and in the, in the violence of the public debate around that issue. Uh, was it necessary to uh, uh, go this way? Uh, absolutely, and I absolutely uh, uh, back President Macron's decision to uh, move on that issue. Is it going to pass? Well, probably because uh, every reforms we made on that issue uh, uh, was at the end of the day accepted. I mean, President Sarkozy uh, in 2010 uh, had its reform of the pension, huge demonstration, huge strikes, and no one came back, came backwards on that law. 
And uh, so I think it's going to it's going to pass, if I may say so. The question is the tensions and the frustrations and the violence in the French society that uh, came up for this occasion, uh, will they disappear? I don't think so. They will probably appear on some other issues at uh, uh, any given time. We are living in a, in a, in a uh, I am living <laughs> in a country where the, the public debate and the, um, and the, and the, the normal rules of democracy are in a way challenged. But I'm not the only one living in such a country. I mean, in the States, uh, then one might argue that, uh, that the, the, the problem or, or the, the challenges are the same, or not exactly the same, but the same. One might argue that in Italy, uh, it's the same. Uh, one might argue that what is uh, currently uh, happening in, in, in Great Britain with the Brexit and with, uh, uh, with uh, a lot of decisions that are being made uh, over there uh, is, is, a, is a, a sign of that, of that challenge. So, so we are living very rough times and, and democracies are challenged abroad and domestically. We, and, and I'm sorry, I don't say that to, I don't, when I say that, I don't mean that the, uh, the, the demonstrators and the people who are opposed to uh, the pension reform are not uh, democratic uh, citizens and, and that they challenge democracy, not at all. I say that um, the rules, normal rules of a, uh, of a representative democracy are being challenged by uh, the poor level of the public debate and by the challenges that uh, a lot of people, populist uh, domestically and abroad, are putting on the, on the very idea that we are a democratic nation. If I may press on the, on the, on the issue of potential costs or trade-offs, do you foresee any costs or trade-offs to President Macron's other domestic policy objectives that will be affected by the reaction to this effort? Well, the big question is, uh, is it possible now to go on to keep on reforming France? Because uh, in 2017, President Macron made a campaign, a very bold, and uh, very impressive campaign uh, with a lot of vision, with a strategy uh, uh, of, 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 uh, of reforms for the, for the country. Uh, and he had the majority and, he, and, and we uh, implemented uh, many reforms that were necessary. In 2022, uh, his campaign way, was more middle of the road, uh, with less commitments, and probably with a, a more cautious, a more cautious approach. And, um, and 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 after the general elections in 2022. Uh, he wasn't able to reach, we were not able to reach a, a, a majority, well, an absolute majority. So, uh, so the majority he has is quite fragile uh, in the parliament. And when you have less commitments and a more fragile majority, it's probably more difficult to go on pushing and to uh, reforming uh, uh, as, uh, as much as, is, uh, as it is needed. So, Probably uh, what will happen is that no one is going to, um, well, the government might not want to uh, uh, go uh, faster and to move uh, uh, bolder. Uh, so it's, it, I understand that perfectly, um, but I know that uh, the, the biggest challenge that France is facing is not, uh, is not doing reforms. It, 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 it is uh, not doing reforms, uh, staying its curse. Um, okay, all right, cool. thank you. Let's turn now to some of the global focus. Yes, thank you again for being with us today. I would like to shift the conversation to foreign policy and more specifically EU relations of France and the war in Ukraine. 
you mentioned in your remarks that a stronger European pillar in the transatlantic alliance is desirable within NATO, but also in terms of a stronger EU and the US needs a stronger EU. You also said that peace used to be used by some Europeans as an excuse to not invest in defense. Being from Germany, I think I know what you're talking about. Um, the Macron government has been an active supporter of deeper EU integration, particularly with regards to defense. What do you see um, in terms of the war in Ukraine? What do you think the role of the war in Ukraine plays? Or what do you think is the role of the war in Ukraine to a stronger European defense policy? And is there anything you would do differently with regards to France's active support of Ukraine in this ongoing war? Um. I think in many ways, uh, the war in Ukraine can be seen uh, as a wake up call for uh, uh, a lot of European countries. Uh, and indeed, the reaction that uh, was voiced in Germany uh, a few days, a few weeks after the beginning of the war, uh, when Germany said that it needed uh, a huge investment in its defense, uh, the way the European countries unite to help Ukraine, well, all those things might be considered as, a, as a, the effect of a wake-up call. So it's probably a good thing. But let me tell you a story which is interesting. Well, I guess it's, I hope it's interesting. Um, a few days after the, uh, uh, the launch of the war, I was in Washington and I had meetings with journalists and, and, and academics. And, um, and you know, we were uh, discussing the uh, world affairs. And, uh, yes. And, um, <laughs> because it's always very easy to discuss those affairs, uh, especially when you have absolutely no way of uh, having an effect on <laughs> those affairs. Uh, and the question they asked me was a very interesting question. They said, well, you know, you're French, which is true. You're French, and you just heard that Germany was spending billions of euros on its defense. How do you like it? A very interesting question. Well, the fact is, it's a very interesting question because no one even considered that question in France, which is crazy. I mean, crazy, which tells a lot about Europe and about our relationship with Germany. The, the very fact that Germany, which we, we have been at war three times in 100 years with Germany, is saying we're going to spend billions on our army and not a French guy in a newspaper or anywhere says, well, is this a good idea? <laughs> no, no one. So, so I think it was seen as a, a wake-up call and that the fact that countries that used to say our defense is insured by the United States uh, uh, started to think that they had to do something not against NATO, not without NATO, but they had to do something. So that would be the good part of the of the of the of the evolution is it only a, a, a good thing i'm not that sure because um, through uh, a lot of countries said we have to do something for our defense and we have to do something uh, autonomously or with our neighbors uh, about our defense but i am not so sure that european countries are on the same page as far as european defense is concerned and we have a, 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 a real, uh, I mean, it's very important for France to explain that position that Europe has to be uh, uh, a military power in a way, mm. not against NATO, not without NATO, but within NATO. And, and, and it's very easy for us to say that because that's what we are doing since very long years. We've been doing that exactly, sometimes uh, with a little bit of frictions with NATO, but, but all in all, uh, not that much friction. 
So, so we still have a lot to do in order to build a European defense. We still have a lot to do in order to convince the European country and the United States that a defense industry, a European defense industry, is not a threat to the US. Uh, and I think we have a lot of work to do towards the US government to explain that if they don't allow a US uh, 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 EU defense industry to develop, uh, at the end of the day, it's not going to be a good news for, for, for them either. Alors, évidemment, quand je le dis en français, c'est plus clair. <laughs> uh, that's that's the thing. When I hear myself speak in English, I'm a little bit frustrated. <laughs> uh, I sound more precise in French. You should, every one of you, learn French. <laughs> All right, I think you're pretty effective in English as well, so good oh. job on that. <laughs> but uh, since you brought up frictions within the transatlantic alliance within Europe, but also um, between the US and uh, Europe and specific member states, I wanna talk about the topic of China and also its connection to the war in Ukraine. Macron recently visited China and met up with President Xi Jinping. And um, they were talking a lot about the war in Ukraine and on possible peace talks in the future. The visit received a lot of mixed responses um, on both sides of the Atlantic, and um, the U.S. sees it essentially as undercutting American efforts uh, to decouple also from China. And you spoke a little bit about the importance of decoupling without fully disengaging from China in your remarks. So in this context, what role does China play for France, both in the short term, but also in the longer term from your perspective? It's not an easy question either, this one. Uh, well, first of all, since uh, you diplomatically said that the trip had received mixed, uh, what do you say? Responses. Responses. Uh, I would say that I wouldn't read too much into the uh, president, the French president declaration, uh, because from what I gather, from what I see, from what I read, and from what I know, French position uh, on China has not uh, been evolving. Uh, the French position on China is merely a position in which we say China is a partner in global matters. There's no way we can you know, tackle the climate crisis without China. There's no way, there's no way. Absolutely no way we can, you know, we can deal with that crisis if, we're not, if we don't work with China. So it's a partner on some issues. It is a, a, it is a competitor on some issues. And it's a risk on some issues. And it's everything. It, it's those three things. And so if you only say that it's a partner, well, you're missing the point. And if you only say that it's a competitor, you're also missing the point. And if you only say that it's a, a, a risk or a menace, well, you probably miss also points. So that's the French position. And that's the reason why President Macron went to China, which by the way, the German chancellor did a few weeks before with a lot of uh, business uh, leader uh, uh, with him, exactly as the French president said, uh, did. Uh, but the French president went to China with the uh, head of the European Commission, which I think was a good thing. So he went there and he engaged with China. Was he right? Yes, of course. He tried to um, give a message to China that it was probably not that good an idea to back and to back uh, strongly Russia in the Ukrainian matter. Did he succeed? Probably not. Was he, uh, was he right to try? Absolutely, yes. And I hope others will try. Uh, so I wouldn't say that the French position, and I'm pretty sure that the French position did not change. And I'm quite comfortable with the French position on China. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, uh, I am not sure that saying 
to every other country that they have immediately and for all matters to choose between the US and between China is a very good approach. I'm not sure of that. Uh, I'm not sure it's a good approach with Europe. And I'm pretty sure it's a very bad approach <laughs> with other countries like India or uh, Vietnam or uh, I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, but I'm <laughs> Did I answer the question? I think so. I yeah. think so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very good job. Can I actually, I was going to ask a follow up on that theme. So, taking aside the comments that on the US side of the Atlantic about related to Taiwan, everybody was upset about, there has been critique, I think, of the impression, whether intended or not, that his engagement with, with Xi Jinping in this context and his engagement with Putin right at the beginning of the war. Uh, their war in Ukraine reflected an effort to kind of represent or speak on behalf of the Europeans that wasn't coordinated or that wasn't really part of the broader plan. Is that, can you speak a little bit to, to how maybe President Macron thinks of that role and whether that critique is warranted on the part of other European partners if he's going it alone in some of these activities? Well, I, I don't think he has ever intended to go for it alone and to pretend that Europe was absolutely behind what he's doing. I think that he likes to engage people. And I think he's right. I don't see the point of not speaking with leaders of countries that we are not at war with. And as much as I defend Ukraine, and as I want Ukraine to win, and as I say that Russia has started, has launched a, 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 a crazy war on Ukraine that Russia has to uh, stop. France is not at war with Russia, neither is the US. So we have to speak with the people we are not at war with, even if they are not uh, okay with us, even if well, that's called diplomacy. That's quite useful, you know? <laughs> uh, and I'm pretty sure you know it here. <laughs> So of course he's right to speak with the uh, with Putin, uh, and and so I back him very much on this one. Uh, voilà. Uh, and the the very fact that he went to China with the head of the European Commission can be read as the sign that he doesn't speak for the European Commission. I mean, he went to China with the head of the European Commission. And Ursula von Leyen, she, she made a speech just before she left to uh, uh, speak about the European position on China, which is a very good speech. And I think you should read it because it's very clear. And I think it's very intelligent. So I, I don't think probably some other countries believe that uh, when he speaks, he thinks he speaks for European countries, but I don't think he does that. What I think he does, and he's probably right, is he tries, maybe he tries to move the European countries' uh, positions because he knows that for a very long time they did not sufficiently engage with the world and with the, the, the question of power in the world. So, so I think he's, he's right. The only critique I would I would I would uh, emit I would uh, is that well it's not a critique it's a lesson I, I I've learned and that I would uh, love to share with you if at some point in your life you are president or prime minister of your country never engage on the flight back of a diplomatic trip with journalists, <laughs> ever. It is always a bad idea. <laughs> and it's very important to engage with journalists, but never on the trip back in a plane after jet lag and elation of the meetings you had, you don't do that. Stage advice. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, trust me on this one. Speaking from experience. <laughs> yes. 
Um, okay, before we um, open it up to the group, I did want to just table one more topic um, that that uh, from a French foreign policy, I think is is uh, been quite in focus of late. And I want to talk a little bit more about France's approach to partners in Africa. Um, you know, by all accounts, one can argue that it's losing influence in Africa. It's ending its military operations in Mali, in Burkina Faso. It faces rising anti-French sentiment in the region. So can you help us think about or help us understand how, how are French officials thinking about the future of France's strategy in Africa, about what its priorities on the continent are, and how it might be thinking about rebuilding some of these partnerships. Obviously, there's a very long and complicated history between France and, and, and uh, African countries, particularly in West and North Africa. Um, so can you help us think about how, how the French are, are viewing that? Well, you're right when you say that it's a very long and complicated history. Uh, there, are, there are strong links between France and a lot of uh, other countries in uh, Central and Western North Africa, of course. Um, Ten years ago, ten years ago, France, the French army sent troops in order to defend uh, Bamako in Mali against uh, a raid uh, that was made by uh, jihadists uh, from the north of the of the Mali towards Bamako. And the French army was sent there and they stopped the raid, and so they defended the capital city. Uh, they defended the the, the governor. And a few months after, President Hollande made a visit in Bamako. And it was probably the time in his life and the place where he was the most popular ever. Not true. If you doubt me, you know, look on your machines and, and, and at Hollande, Bamako, crowds of, you know, cheering, thank you, President Hollande. Only in Bamako. <laughs> Thank you, France. And the French, the French decided that they would stay in, in Mali at the invitation of the government to defend Mali. And they did that, exactly that, with the help of the US. With the help of the US. And I know what we owe to the US in this operation. But it was French troops and then European troops, but mostly French troops. 95% of the troops were French. Well, then there was a coup in, in, in Mali and that the government, which was working very intensely with Russia, uh, invited the Wagner Corps uh, to uh, settle in Mali, uh, developed an anti-French position, and we were not welcome anymore. Okay, there's no reason, that, there's, no, there's not a chance, not a possibility for the French army and for the French government to stay in Mali if the uh, current authorities of Mali don't want us to stay. So I think President Macron took the good decision. He said, okay, we withdrew. It's the choice of Mali. Is it a good choice? I don't know. It's for the people of Mali to say, does it guarantee the security of Bamako and the security of Mali? We will see. I am not that optimistic, but we will see. And in fact, it's more the Mali problem than the French problem. Does it mean that the French army or the French government will withdraw completely from Africa? Absolutely not. We will cut our forces by 50%, but we will uh, keep forces in uh, West African countries and in uh, Central African countries, if the countries are willing to accept them, and probably, in working together differently with the uh, government of those countries uh, uh, because it's, it's needed. So, and, and we, know, we know where a part, not all, but a part of the anti-French uh, 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 protests are coming from. Uh, we know because with the US, we were able to identify the responsible of those campaign of anti-French uh, movements, and a lot of them were paid by Russia, and a lot of them were uh, uh, okay, well, you understood the idea. <laughs> um, does it mean that we don't engage anymore with Africa? Absolutely not. We uh, were uh, absolutely uh, uh, instrumental in the transformation 
of the uh, franc CFA, that is the currency that is used by a lot of West African countries, and it has changed quite dramatically. Uh, we decided with a lot of those countries to settle uh, uh, memory issues and sending back uh, uh, objects and, and pieces of arts that had been taken by the French during the colonization. Um, so, so our presence and our links with African countries we are going to evolve, that's for sure. But I, I just want to state and, and to, to remind you that the one who are criticizing what is left of French presence, economic or political presence in Africa, are generally in very strong relationship with governments that consider that they have to take the place of France. I mean, right now, there is another scramble for Africa. It's not a political one, it's an economical one. And China, Turkey, and other countries, of course, are a part of it. And it's obvious, China, Russia, Turkey, and other countries are a part of it. So we, we can, of course, uh, discuss about the consequences of the uh, last scramble for Africa of the other centuries, but there's a new one going on. And I think we should speak about this one. Okay, thank you. So lots covered in this, and I think we could go deeper on any of these topics, but I do wanna give time to students to ask their questions, follow up on what's already been discussed. So with the remaining time, let me go ahead and open it up to the audience here for questions. Svenja and I will, will help moderate the Q&A. When we do call and you do give your name and at least the program that you're with here at the Kennedy School and uh, before introducing your question. Okay, uh, let's go here first. Oh, do we have a uh, mic? Have, yeah. oh. Hi, can I start? Uh, yeah, let's go here and then um, we'll get another mic over to you. Hi, I'm Ludovic, uh, an MBA at the, at the Business School. I had a question on your remarks about the, the underlying tensions um, in the protest not going away and likely manifest, manifesting somewhere else. What do you think is the root cause of this, this malaise? And is it economic growth? Is it a renewed sense of grandeur that would, that would solve it? Or what is it? Well, besides the rationality, uh, the inherent irrationality of, of the public debate on pension reform, I see a few points that are very strong in France, but which are not specifically, specifically French. A uh, few of them. The first one is, uh, and, and they explain also what happened during the Yellow Jackets protest that you may remember, which took place in 2018 and 2019. Um, the first reason is probably something which a lot of uh, Western democracy have experienced. It is the uh, impoverishment of the lower middle class. It is. It has started at the beginning of 2000 in certain uh, countries like Italy. And it has accelerated in a lot of Western democracies after the 2008 financial crisis. And the thing is for a democracy, when there's an impoverishment of the lower middle class, it's never a good sign, never. So that's the first reason. The second reason would be, in my view, um, what, I, what I call the cultural anxiety. I'm not sure that's the good word, but anyway, that's the word I use. <laughs> uh, cultural anxiety, what is that? It is, it is a very complex or proteiform feeling, which goes um, when, when you are experiencing the fact that what you took for granted is no longer here. The way you are living cannot uh, go on. It can be because when you're Brits, the European Court of Human Rights say that uh, you cannot live like that. It can be when you're French, when the uh, European Judicial Court of uh, uh, Luxembourg say that you cannot use uh, uh, non-pasteurized milk in order to make camembert. It can be uh, the, eff the effect of immigration and the fear that your country is changing too fast and that you don't understand and that you don't stand that, uh, that mood. 
you know, it's everything that take away from you what you supposed was a given in your way of life. And this is not only French. This happens in Italy, this happens in, 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 in Great Britain, probably it happens in the United States. That's the second reason, in the uh, uh, cultural anxiety. The third reason I would say is, is it goes with that anxiety. It has to do with climate change. It has to do with uh, the tensions in the world. It is the feeling, which is not only a feeling, but it's something which is deeply uh, uh, felt by a lot of people, that their children will live a more difficult life than what they lived. And that, again, is something very dangerous in a democracy. Because the promise of a democracy is that if you do the thing right and you work a lot, well, your children will live uh, better than you did. And that's what happened uh, since the beginning of the Western democracies, in a way, with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and that is something which is not felt anymore by a lot of people. And the fourth aspect would be the, the, the feeling that experience in France, in the US, in a lot of Western democracies, that people are now too far away from the people or the places where decisions are being taken. That they don't matter anyway, that they don't participate in the decision process uh, making uh, of their country. And if you mix all that uh, in, in, you know, in a, in, in a bowl, you have a very, very, very dangerous uh, product. I think it's probably that product which explain in the US the victory of Donald Trump. And I think that's exactly that product which uh, uh, explains the yellow jacket in France. And I think that's exactly that product which explains the victory first of the Cinque Stelle movement in Italy, then the victory of Meloni on the extreme right. And I don't think that product uh, has disappeared. And when I said that it was a tough time for democracies, it's going to be very difficult for democracies to live and to uh, thrive, thrive. To thrive uh, as long as they are not able to make that product disappear. Thank you. Let's go here. Julian, do you have a mic? That's very joyous. So. Huh? <laughs> Yes. Okay. yes. Uh, my name is Nelly Russo. I'm a second year MPA student here at the Kennedy School. Um, thank you so much for taking time to come and to speak with students who aspire to serve France uh, after Harvard. I'd love to question your definition of France as a middle class power, <laughs> but I'm also curious to hear your thoughts on the French political landscape um, with many political leaders capitalizing on dissatisfaction and the polarization of the French society. As the leader of Horizons, I would like to, to know how you foresee the challenge of holding moderate political positions and um, this combined with the tense uh, context. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who are non-French, uh, Horizons is the, is the most magnificent political <laughs> party that was ever created. <laughs> which is probably not uh, well known abroad, but which should be. And uh, uh, to be serious, uh, to be serious, uh, well, I'm not here to speak about French politics, but if you ask, uh, I would say that um, there will be a general, general and a presidential election four years from now. And I would say that uh, never in recent history, well, probably never in French history, uh, the prospect of uh, someone coming from the far right winning the presidential election has been uh, that high. Uh, and of course, it's not a good idea for me, and it's not something I like, and it's something I want to fight against. Uh, voilà. Uh, voilà. Okay. Okay. Uh, is there in the back there? <laughs> yep. We'll take the gentleman in the far back row there. Thank you. 
those conditions. Oh, can, can I just can I just add something? I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Can I just add something? And 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 when I say that's something I want to fight against, let me be clear about that. The only way to win against the far right and uh, Monsieur or Madame Le Pen is not. You you will not win this time by saying that. She is not competent or that she is fearsome. You will win if you can explain to the French people what you want to do. And the fact is, French, like the US, French, like the US, are political nations which are not holding themselves together by an ethnical root or by anything that other than the will of living together and the project they can share together. I'm not sure if I'm really precise in English, but that's really what I mean. And if there is no project strategy that bounds the French people together, then it's becoming very dangerous. And so uh, that fight will not be win only by saying that far right is bad or is dangerous or is incompetent, which it is, it's going to be win if you can explain and share with the French people a strategy, credible, viable, of what you want to build during the next 30 years. And I'm very much uh, convinced of what I just said. Sorry. Hi, all good. Um, I'm... I'm really sorry. I'm going to continue the the domestic politics uh, thread for just uh, just a minute. Uh, I'm Damien. I'm a PhD student in chemical physics. Um, I so I I've been wondering for a while. I mean, um, with uh, Macron doing really well, obviously for for in both elections. I mean, winning both elections, we've seen that the center party. Um, and a collection of center parties, but overall the center has grown really strong and in so doing has weakened the moderate left and right, Les Républicains and the Parti Socialiste being um, much weaker than they used to be. And I guess as a result, um, making the far left and far right much stronger. It seems to me like those moderate center, a strong moderate center party will in unavoidably gives ri give rise to very, very strong far left and far right. Is there a solution to that? Or do you disagree with that assessment? Thank you. So I, I, I don't disagree with it uh, because what you say, what you describe is true, uh, obviously. Um, I would even say that for the first time in France, we are living under a, a, a three party, or not a three party, but a, a three groups organization. And it's very new for France. Because France was living uh, from 58, that is the beginning of the Fifth Republic, to uh, a few years uh, uh, in a system in which there were, there, were, there were the left and there was the right. It was a two party or a two camps or two groups organi uh, organization. The left was divided in many uh, parties and the right was divided in many parties. But at the end of the day, at the end of the presidential election, it was left against right. Okay. It lasted for a long time. Then the extreme right appeared on the political scene, but it was still a two-group uh, 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 drama because, because at the presidential election, if there was the extreme right, both the left and the right would unite poorly, but really in order to beat the extreme right. So, at the end of the day, it was still a two group fight. And right now, since 2022, and I don't know for how long, I'm absolutely unable to say for how long it will last, we have a three group, a three partition of the political scene between the extreme right, the extreme left, and what I say is the uh, central bloc, which is absolutely diverse, 
uh, but the central block of the French policy. And the question is, in order to prevail, how this center block is going to organize itself. For a very long uh, period of time, President Macron thought that it would be united under his, uh, his, 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 his supervision, uh, in a way, uh, and that he would uh, uh, unify everyone that is not on the extreme left and not on the extreme right. And this does not happen because a lot of people going from the social Democrats to the uh, 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 traditional Republicans, which don't want to ally with the extreme, with the far right, but which, who don't want to be looked at uh, uh, as a member of the majority, um, there is a need to organize that central bloc. And I think politically, it's going to be one of the most important thing in the 2027 perspective how to organize this center block. If it don't organize, if it's, uh, if it's, if, if it's too diverse, the risk of the victory of uh, the far right or the far left is serious. And I don't think it's going to be the far left. Let's move the mic over there, maybe. I'm hoping for a foreign policy question now. Okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, you got your wish. It's a foreign policy question. Um, so my name is Khadija. I was a student here and I'm a current fellow at Belfer. Um, and so I want to go back a little bit to your earlier comments on France's relationship um, with Africa. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. There are some bad actors trying to in influence um, anti-French sentiment on the continent. But I think that there also is legitimate criticism in terms of French engagement with the continent besides the military aspect. Um, so I know like I was in Senegal and one of the points of um, debate there is France's role in CEFA. Um, in the upcoming election, France's relationship with Senegal is a, a big talking point. Um, so I think there is a lot of on the ground criticism in terms of French's relationship on a political level and a perceived imbalance of power and influence that France has on domestic affairs. So I'm wondering if you could talk more in terms of as France thinks about um, reestablishing its relationship on the continent, besides from a military and security angle, like what do you think are some of the um, main points of issues that France really needs to like engage with the continent with not just political leaders, but with um, civilians and, and domestic uh, populations on the continent in order to create um, a newer, a better relationship on the continent? Thank you for your question, and 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 and, and you're right. Uh, it's good that you say that it's not only other people that are uh, fueling that anti-French uh, sentiment, but that there are also legitimate questions about the role of France in in Western Africa. Uh, so you're right. It's very difficult to express a French strategy, given given the the complexity. Uh, of the past. It's really very difficult because if France say we are going to engage, we are going to be very present, well, people will say, well, why is that? <laughs> okay, well, what allows you to say that you have a, 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 a manifest destiny, not the right word, but manifest destiny of being very present in Africa? So, uh, and, and especially in, 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 not in Northern Africa where you know, we have neighbors, but in Western Africa. But if we don't, people will say, well, you're, you're, you're leaving and, and you don't want to assess the responsibility you had or you have and, and the links you created. So it's, it's quite difficult. And when I look at what the French president said about Africa, during the last 15 years, I see the difficulty, and, 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 and Nicolas Sarkozy uh, had a lot of troubles expressing a French strategy for Africa, but President Hollande did also have a lot, and President Macron did also have a lot of troubles. Uh, so what can we do? We can probably work on economic and business relation. We should do that more. But when I look at what's happening, it doesn't go that way. 
you saw, for instance, that the big French logistic uh, company that is uh, very much present in Western Africa sold its activities to an Italian company, I must say. Uh, the French banks are, in my view, less and less present uh, in uh, African economies. Um, of course, we should work on education and higher education, not only higher education, but education. But it's also quite difficult, uh, more difficult than what I thought. So expressing a clear strategy is difficult. Obviously, France has to be modest when it, when it speaks about Africa. I think a, a bit of humility is a, 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 will be a, appropriate. <laughs> uh, but at the end of the day, you know, maybe you know that, I hope you do, that within France and in France, you have an enormous amount of people who look to Africa as a special place for them because they have a link, because they have strong ties, because once their family was living over there, because a lot of people coming from Africa are now French and live in France. So the relationship is very strong. I hope it's not going to be only a symbolic and sentimental relationship, but that it's going to be something we can build, build upon seriously. Um, but I'm aware of the risks and of the fragilities of that relationship. Yes. yes. And as far as France CFA is concerned, let's be totally frank. I have not always heard within the public declarations of African leaders and within their private conversations with me, exactly the same comment on France CFA. There are sometimes not only small differences, but huge differences. And so it is a system, a monetary system that is often criticized, but it is also a monetary system that has produced good things and, 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 and stability in, in Western Africa. So it evolved recently. It was decided that it would evolve, which is a good thing. And, and, and I hope it shows that we can have discussions and we can find agreements in the common interest of Western African countries in France. We have a couple more minutes. So. Can we go to this side a little bit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello. Is there one in the back over here? Yes. Lady here. Hello. Oh. Yep. Hi, my name is Maria. I'm from Brazil. I'm not a student here. I'm just visiting the public health uh, school. And on your speech, you mentioned very briefly the global self-awareness. And I really do want to talk about it because, well, the war between Ukraine and Russia, well, winning or losing, the global south always loses. So we have awareness of the war. We understand the risks of the war and we understand both sides. I want to understand really what does Europe, especially and France in your case, want from the global south in this war? Do you want resources? Do you want military alliances? What do Europe expect the global south to keep giving to Europe um, in exchange of? Can, can I, uh, I'm sorry, it's a little bit Jesuitic, but can I answer your question by another question? What do you mean when you say we understand both sides? Well, we, the global south, I mean, especially Latin America, understands the risks and loses of both sides. So if Russia loses or wins, we understand what this means to us. So in case of, if Russia gains the power, it's going to be bad for the global south. If Europe gains the power, it's going to be bad for the global south. In the end is, the global south always loses. That's what we believe. And in the, especially in Brazil right now, we have ties with Russia through BRICS and we have ties with Europe through economic agreements. So Brazil in specifically, 
will remain neutral because of economic ties to both sides. So that's what I mean with what do you really want from the Global South to do in this war when we do lose and win with both. Okay. Um, so I think uh, hearing you, I can say that I don't agree with the premises of your question. I don't see, I don't think that you lose either side. I don't think so. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think so. I don't think that Brazil loses anything if Russia uh, stop the war it decided to launch. I don't think so. I think Brazil might lose much more if Russia keeps on doing this war. And I don't think India wins anything in this war if Russia wins. I don't think so. So I'm, I'm, I'm not totally, uh, I don't totally agree uh, with the premises of your question. But what do we expect? Well, we would like that major countries like the BRICS, uh, hugely important for the future, don't uh, consider that it's not their problem and that it's not that important if Russia says, okay, uh, I'm going to take that country because it used to be mine. And I would be very much surprised that the BRICS country uh, could find any sympathy for such a logic. Because what I see in Ukraine is the very definition of imperialism by Russia. This country used to be mine. It has very strong links with my country. Ukraine used to be a part of the Soviet Union. Willingly, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure, but it used to be a part of the Soviet Union. And if you can say, well, it used to be a part of the Soviet Union, so I have a, 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 an eternal right of saying that I will take this country into my country. I will take it by force. Well, that's interesting. I, I, I find it interesting that Brazil thinks that it's okay. Because, well, uh, okay, the risk that Portugal comes back is limited. Right. You're right. You're right. But in a lot of countries of the world, in a lot of regions of the world, Accepting that imperialism, brute force, total disrespect for institutions that are democratic. I don't say that Ukraine is the most magnificent democracy in the world. I don't say that, but it's a democracy. Accepting that, saying that it's, of course, not our problem because it's lose-lose or win-win. I don't think that's a good position. And we would like, and, and it's something we have to do, we would like to convince Brazil and other countries, that you cannot stand uh, you can you cannot step aside. Voila. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, we are at we are actually past time. So I do we'll, we will have to stop there. But I do want to thank you all for joining us and a special thank you again to Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Mayor Philippe. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank today. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. And next time we do that in French.